Hello, welcome to the latest episode of The Nines. I'm Monte Cristo. Joining me is owner of Cloud9, Jack Etienne. We are here today. Uh, this is going to be part of the new version of The Nines where we're going into deep dives with individual players or members of Cloud9 every single week. So it should be interesting uh, to talk to them in depth about their gameplay. Now, we don't have gameplay this week. We have Jack. And the reason we have Jack is because we're going to be talking about updates to the company culture, how it feels to finally win in League of Legends again, which has uh, been a long time coming. Uh, so welcome. Oh, thank you for having me. This is pretty exciting uh, <laughs> to actually come in as a uh... Uh, a winner from the prior split and not having to make excuses on how we're going to get better. But it definitely feels good to get that off my back. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, I mean, you, you've kind of been, you, you came into League of Legends, immediately won, and then there was a, a long dry spell there while TSM and Team Liquid were dominating for the last several years. So what was it, how has it been to get back onto the, the gold medal podium? It, it feels really good, not going to lie. Like, um, we were so dominant our first two splits that it almost it kind of almost felt like it was the expected result from a split and you know then we came fairly close the the next two splits and thought like oh we're just going to turn this around well, you know the next split's going to happen and after like five six years it's really actually becomes painful our fans are upset about it we're upset about it um you know going i think we've actually lost more finals uh, than any other team the lcs or lec and that's not something i really like uh, I'm, I'm not happy to be uh uh to be the owner of that so it feels it feels incredibly good to um not only finally win but to do it in the in the manner that we did it which was like a a, a very specific decision to change our approach to the split and and the way that uh me my management and the players uh, worked together so what were the differences that you made this year in terms of changing the team? Because obviously there's been a lot to deconstruct now that the news of Vulcan's buyout has come through. You've talked to ESPN publicly about that. Uh, what were the steps you were taking and what were the things you were trying to address on the roster after you guys kind of bombed out of Worlds last year? It was pretty. It was a pretty disappointing finish to a, a nearly championship season in, in North America. Um, you know, I think that... As a group, we um, gave a lot of leeway for players to focus on other pursuits besides actually their main pursuit, which is to actually win LCS and be the best like League of Legends player possible. Um, and um, it felt pretty good because we like historically because we would always be a contender and we're always getting pretty close. But after a while, it, it started really to grade on us. And specifically after Last Worlds, there was too many instances of like my top players feeling. Um, really frustrated that not everyone on the team had the same uh, uh, focus and the same put in the same effort to get better. And so, uh, you know, after the, the massive reconstruction was all around building around players that put in the time to be the best at, at the best league player they could be. Let's go find other players that share that ideal. Um, let's make sure all management and coaching is get there to support them in those ideals. And we set up a really good structure and culture to follow that pursuit. And, um, you know, uh, I, you know, my expectation is like, hey, we're going to get to finals, but we're going to do it our own ways. And, we're, and if we do lose, like, you know, it's okay because we're going to get better for summer. Turns out we came in just smashing and we didn't need another split. We were ready to go uh, right away in spring and coming into summer, we feel like equally strong, if not stronger. What are the techniques you're taking? Because one of the topics of conversation is the kind of lack of quality practice in North America. So how how have you been able to be this dominant and, and maintain this skill gap between Cloud9 and the rest of LCS in 2020 while your competition hasn't been good? What techniques are you, are you guys using? Yeah, it started actually... Um... Uh, at Worlds, where the last several years at Worlds, we come in as like the play-in team, and we had to make the best of really bad scrims. Um, and so, no matter how poor our opponent was, we needed to like, that to to review a play. And just because like the play was successful, was it actually good? Was it was was uh, were, were there things that happened that could have like a smarter, better opponent would have taken advantage of? And it was a lot of analysis and self-reflection on. Um, on the plays that we we're doing, was it the right play, the best play for the time? Should have we done something else? And, and using those strategies to like review 
your scrims and then applying it here in North America has been really beneficial for us to continue getting stronger regardless of the competition not really being up to par. And is it the coaching staff that you mainly put trust in on that? Or is it some, I know Gary, we we talked to in the interview that we did a few months ago on the channel about some of the mental techniques and uh, psychological coaching that he's giving the team. What are the factors that go into that? So setting it up, I mean, on a day-to-day -day basis at this point, like it's the players policing themselves, the coaches participating and supporting them. But at the beginning and like before the season, we spend a lot of time like structuring what we think is the perfect setup. And then before the season even starts, we meet up with the coaches, come up with a bunch of strategies on, on how to approach practice, how to improve, then meet with the players, discuss our thoughts. They buy they, they buy into what they buy into. They change what they think needs to be changed. But the at the end of that preparation, the entire culture is something that players have not just been told, like top down, this is how it's going to be. They've bought into it themselves. They've adjusted it to what they think is going to work the best. And then they're running with it. So we've kind of set the table and then they're just, you know, crushing, crushing what's, you know, been set out for them. So one of the things is the, the kind of work ethic that goes into the C9 players right now. And that's been celebrated, I think, as part of the new direction of Cloud9. And you can see that with like Zven has rank one and three on the NA server right now, if I'm not mistaken. And Vulcan has number two. I think that was true as of yesterday. Uh, are these the kind of players, like what are you looking for in Cloud9 players, not just in League of Legends, but across esports right now? Um, just one quick thing. I'm uh, you're going a little robot on me, oh, so I'm not sure if, Twi if Twitch chat sees that at all, if they, they can respond so you can deal with it there. But I heard what you said. Um, uh, I think what was really cool about this current team is like when I took the, the you know, when I took Licorice and Nisky and Blabber, we set like our ideals of what we wanted out of our players. And then we went out to shop on who we we're going to to fill our holes, or, which is our bot lane. We found two guys that they already put in more work than we were asking for. And when they joined and went immediately to Korea, just started crushing it. And like literally we put like in two or three weeks of practicing in Korea, they put in more games than most NA players do all year long. And so look, you just kind of think about that. Um, and um, so what you're seeing with Vulcan and Zen just dominating NA and having like three of the top four accounts um, is just an extension of the work that they put in and they totally buy into it. And it's really nice, like, you know, when you have a bot lane that understands what works for them so well, it allows like our drafts to be, go much smoother because they can direct us on exactly what's going to be good for them um, and allows us to play a bunch of different play styles uh, because we, we, can, we have absolute confidence that they're gonna be, be able to uh, check off the objectives that we have for them. And is this the prototype for Cloud9 players as a whole for the organization moving forward, or is this just for the League of Legends team? So when we when we set up like the culture workshop uh, last year, it was definitely that hey, this is like the first. Uh, this is going to be the first team we're going to put this focus into, and then we're going to spread it out to the rest of the organization. And we're really like a laser focus on the LCS team um, uh, at you know at the end of last year, and then we moved into getting our academy team onto it at the beginning of this year. And it's going to be something that spreads across the entire organization, not only like as our players, but our our staff as well. I, I need them to be completely bought into the system of how we work, and I think it's going to be really beneficial to them. What do you think? Uh, can you name the kind of core values or how you want people to work in this in this system? What what are you looking for for people who want to be pro gamers or or staff members for Cloud Nine? Um, you know, a lot of it is like uh, you know a res a respect for the organization that you're joining into and wanting to leave Cloud Nine or the team that you're a part of in a better place than when you when you actually found it. Uh, understanding that there took a lot of effort to get to where we are now, and 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 a willingness and desire to make it better as you walk away. Um, and how you do that is every single day you look to do improve on the whatever job that you has have in front of you. So if you're a manager, you want to make sure that. You know the the P1 visas are you know are are uh, you know getting in on time. You're working really closely with our legal team. You're making sure that the players, when they you know when they actually get here, that they have a you know really safe, smooth experience. Especially with COVID going on, we just brought in a new player from New York. You know we had to make sure that you know he got here safely. We had safe transportation from the airport to 
um, his quarantine facility for two weeks and then he you know safely moved into the team like these you basically each person needs to take personal responsibility to use their brain to actually you know make their job better uh, and and they need to do things without being necessarily told to do that. They need to be able to figure out how can I, you know, okay, I have the system in front of me. I think I can improve on it. Talk to my manager. What do you think about this? Okay, cool. Yeah, let's do that. Let's, you know, let's, let's change this process that could be improved. And it might be seem like little small improvements, you know, day over day, but those things really add up over time. Yeah. And when it comes to the pro players as well, uh, when you're introducing them, like you said, in this in this coronavirus pandemic, so you're trying to get them into the team houses, taking that two week quarantine. And then what happens once they're there? What are the kind of restrictions that you you've been working with with the pro players currently? Oh, it's uh it's pretty wild. We're we're used to it now because we've literally had these things in place since the end of February. But, you know, uh, pro players are, are they can depend on their management for all of their food. So we, we work with a private caterer to have food arrive for breakfast and for lunch. Um, no players are making their own like Uber, like uh, Uber or, or or Postmate orders. Uh, really just trying to reduce infection points. Um, we, you know, obviously the, the essentials, like if, you, if you're taking a walk outside, make sure you're wearing a mask. We have all those masks available to you. Make sure you understand how to properly wash your hands. Um, and also have like setups in case, hey, if someone gets sick, what are we gonna do? We've got like housing associated ready to go. Should that actually happen? Um, it's, uh, it's, it's complicated. Um, some of the other things we did is like, we really wanted to make sure that uh, it takes a lot to run these, these this organization, uh, we have you know cleaning staff to keep the house clean. We used to have them; they live remotely and they come every day to clean the house. But by having people come from the outside in, you don't know this additional infection points, right? So we actually found which of our cleaning staff would be willing to move into the house with the players to make sure that like we reduce wow. the infection point there. Yeah, <laughs> our managers, like our managers, moved into the house too. You know, um, thankfully, like you know, we have literally four houses within a block and our dota team uh, wasn't able to move out here because of uh p1 visa and restrictions we just it just turned out hey we just need to shut down our dota team because um we're not going to get these players here for a year plus so we you know we stepped away from dota that left us with a whole house to move in you know cleaning staff and management staff and content staff as well you know they need you know someone needs to hold a camera so um you know we thankfully had you know a good infrastructure to to set that up and as for the as for the long-term plans with coronavirus how long is this going to go on now that los angeles is slowly starting to open back up and some of the services do you have any idea what the time frame is on this we're being really cautious i mean if you look at the um the, the new daily cases, the infection rate here in, in California and uh, Los Angeles specifically, they've never slowed down. They're, you know, uh, the, it's up and to the right, unfortunately. And we see that uh, every few days there's a new record on the number of new infections here in Los Angeles. So um, until I personally see that these numbers uh, have like dipped down dramatically, I'm going to continue being very careful with my team. For the rest of the esports industry, uh, it seems like everything's going to be online for the foreseeable future. And, you know, you've got the CSGO team there and you've got the League of Legends team and the Academy team all in those various houses right now. How are you facilitating their online experience or making it so that uh, they can actually have good performances? Because one of the criticisms of being online is that many times it warps results or players don't take it seriously or it creates anomalous results in many cases. So what's your procedure for getting them into the right mindset like they would be if they were walking into a LAN event? That's a good question. It's, a real, it's actually a real issue. Um, when we first went online the first weekend of games, um, the players walked away saying that felt like a scrim. I took way too many risks. It didn't feel right. Um, I didn't get to the same level of uh, seriousness that I should, like on a stage game. Uh, so we, what we ended up doing is we we hit the Dota house again. Um, we set up a stage at the Dota 2 house um, where we kind of set up a, a break rooms um, and a stage that was similar, as, as similar as possible to LCS. And just the fact that the players were getting 
fully suited up as if they're going to LCS stage, going to a new location, had the, the same type of setup as they would as if they were at LCS, got the guys to be in more of a stage-like mode uh, where they would level up the level of seriousness um, for the for the the stage games that were online and that you know those um it might seem silly but those things actually really matter for for players because the scrim environment as much as we try to make it the same like stages it's uh the games go differently our opponents always play much more conservatively than they do in scrims and so it affects the way you play so as whatever we can do to try to make it feel like a stage environment will help us in our performance are you planning on doing that or using that house for all of the teams? It's just sort of specifically the LAN house, or is it just for the League of Legends team? So uh, that's another good question. We really siloed off the teams away from each other. So the cleaning crew that works with Counter-Strike does not work with our League of Legends team. The managers that work with um, Counter-Strike don't work with, don't, or don't work with, nor have any contact with our League of Legends team. So uh, just in case one player and one of the teams gets sick and starts running through the team, we want to make sure the other teams aren't impacted by it. So right now, that house that we use, do stage games for the LCS team, it's the only team that's in there. And the only people who are in that house are, are staff that are associated with the League of Legends team, just trying to like silo things out as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, I can I can see that this is all very well thought out. Is this all your design? <laughs> I think a lot about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can tell. I can tell. <laughs> uh, so coming into this next split, um, having to, to change it back to the actual performance of the League of Legends team, how what is your expectation? Because surely, like this must have been a surprise if we look back and on the spring split and going what 17 and one only losing what a couple games over the course of the entire 2020 so far this is a hugely impressive performance and not one that i think was reasonable to predict so with that in mind like having vastly or at least a you know nominally exceeded your expectations what are you, where, are you, where are you at coming into summer in terms of what to expect out of the the lol roster um uh you know, frankly, we we expected to win spring. We didn't expect to win with such an such sure. a dominant faction, sure. uh, fashion. But we did expect to win. We didn't really talk about it because it just didn't like until you actually put up. We don't really we, didn't, we wanted to shut up. And this is actually show through our wins. Um, as coming into summer, like the expectation by the fans, by the other teams, and by ourselves again that we're going to win it. The thing is, is that like you know we have to focus on getting better every single day. Um, and I think that some of these teams have made some some really good adjustments so it's going to be tougher for a couple of reasons a the adjustments um the coaching or players or is i think has been good um and for number two like a lot of these players like when they're walking towards worlds they 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 change to a different mode. Like I know impact is going to be a beast in summer because he's always really good in summer and he's incredible in summer playoffs. And, and, and so there's a lot of players in the league, like our that there's like, as we get towards worlds to get into worlds mode, and it's going to be a lot tougher. Um, so I'm, I'm excited. I think we're going to see a much more competitive split in summer and that's important. It's important for all the teams to be pushing each other to be better. I think part of it too, is a lot of the teams weren't, really looking towards spring uh, because it, it lacks kind of the weight that it used to. It's not giving any kind of circuit points towards worlds anymore. Is this an adjustment that you think should be made from the riot side to make spring more impactful or potentially roll spring and summer into one longer season? Um, I, uh, you know, I actually think, and, I'm, and I think maybe I'm, uh, on the minority on this, but I think spring is super valuable. I think uh, any international experience in League of Legends is super sure. valuable. Um, you I could still have that, that with a longer season. You just say whoever has the best record at the 50% sure. mark, or you have a tournament that decides who goes, even if it doesn't affect like the larger season. So they're not mutually exclusive. Yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, although I do like the, the smaller discrete events. I mean, I, I would be down for having, you know, four tournament like events 
uh, for the year versus two. Um, I really like. We would all like that. <laughs> yeah, and so um, so going to a longer format, I definitely wouldn't be happy about that. Um, I would I would rather see like you know an early tournament, and then you know, like if the more the better because I I love the story of you know the start in the middle at the end of these tournaments um, and not taking so long so you get a result of, of, of uh, for whatever that current meta is i think it's a lot more exciting at least for me personally and um and i think maybe because i'm involved in a lot of other games like you know i can't imagine my counter-strike players ever saying yo like you know the spring split doesn't matter because this one international event isn't that big i mean that to me it's just mind blowing. <laughs> why, are, why are you in this job because like the uh, MSI is one of the biggest events in esports. It, you should be incredibly proud of going to that event and participating in that event. It's huge. And so um, I, I frankly I was so confused by the by the mindset of some players on, they wouldn't be on cloud nine if they had that mindset, but the, 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 the mindset of some players that spring didn't matter I mean, that, that it was totally mind blowing <laughs> to me. You know, I think one of the issues, it, it is interesting because MSI is obviously, if you look at it from a competitive perspective, a hugely prestigious event, it features, you know, the best teams from all of these regions. I honestly believe that part of the problem with the perception of MSI is that its name is Mid-Season Invitational, which sounds yeah. complete shit, honestly. Like, it sounds completely terrible, and it doesn't really have any level of you're prestige right, <laughs> to the name. Like, when you're like, I won the Mid-Season Invitational, like, that, it just sounds like some, sound some good, corporate right? horse shit, and I just sort of, like, shrugged my shoulders. I'm like, that doesn't sound cool at all. Like, I honestly think that rebranding it and changing the name and and really, like, going hard in, in terms of promoting like the prize or promoting the prestige of it would go a long way to yeah. kind of making it b be taken more seriously. Cause I mean, yeah. if you compare... like Dota, you went a major and then you yeah, go to exactly. CI, yeah. It, a major sounds like serious. Uh, mid season invitational by definition does not sound very good. Like, like everything. And I never even realized that but you're right. Every, everything about it just sounds so terrible. Like yeah. mid season, it just sounds like, well, this is halfway through the season. Let's just throw it away. I, mean, I actually never, I never use in, you know the full name, but and, and I'm never going to now because <laughs> it sounds crap. You're right. So I, I, I just think it's been like the actual design of it has been bad, and like I think you, if you add a couple more teams to it too, I think you can do a couple things. I think you can, I think part of the other problem why players don't want to play for it is because you have to win spring in order to go. So you know it's it's all or nothing, like in the regions at the very least. And I think yeah. opening it up even to maybe two First teams, the second, yeah, be huge. yeah, That'd just be the huge. finalists for every region and then changing the name so that it actually sounds cool and sounds like something I yeah. want to win. Uh, yeah. I think, I think it has a PR problem. Maybe it has add some, <laughs> add some skins in there for the Olympian winners or something like super special um, as a takeaway, maybe like regional, some sort of regional skin or something. I don't know, but like, I, I agree. Like, you know, at, it's a massive event. It's so prestigious. They, they, these are easy for at least the name. Um, obviously adding additional teams adds a lot more complexity, but I think that would make it really cool too. Yeah. So I, I, and I think like changing it to a major or changing it to something like that would be super valuable overall. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I agree with you that it's easier to keep teams motivated. So on this tournament note, one thing that we can discuss is uh, the change for Overwatch League as well, because for those of you who don't know, Overwatch League has, for the rest of this year, changed from a tournament or a, a league model into a monthly tournament model after the success, uh, relative success, I should say, of the May Melee tournament that, you know, happened last month. Is this a change that you're liking to see and would like to see maybe in more esports as well? Yeah, absolutely. The the long the long the long season is is not nearly as exciting as the uh, discrete events. So more of it, uh, I, you know. I love you know back in the, in the earlier days like the the discrete tournaments, MLGs of the of, of the of the time, uh, where you'd come in for a week and you'd see you'd see you know clear winners for that weekend. They could be the champions for that event. I I would love to see more of that. I, mean, I think it's like interesting too, at least in the Overwatch perspective, because you can tie those kind of tournament finals in with homestands in a post-pandemic world, I think in a really compelling way that would drive people to go out there in the same way that we see people uh, heading out for, you know, the the finals of a Counter-Strike tournament or something like that. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, the the Overwatch like results like speak for themselves. So, like it it definitely energized a community that was hurting, and um, so it was it was some good news and and pretty dark days over there. I mean, the token drops obviously helped as well, but I you know that's coming to League of Legends. So, what are what are your expectations for the kind of uh like digital item drops let's say that are coming to to league of Legends side of esports as well because clearly part of this is that they want to drive viewership to their website lol esports because that's where you get the the drops and in theory that's very good for riot because the more people that watch on their website it means that they're not completely chained to twitch or youtube or whoever it may be because they can change where the stream is hosted or who their their media partner is well, you know, and and that will be the their method for retaining their viewership, even if they go exclusive or something like that. I'm, I'm pretty excited to see them try different things like this. I think it's I think it's good for the leagues. So I, we, want, I want them to ex experiment and try. Different <laughs> things like that. Sure. And obviously we know that from Counter-Strike, from Overwatch, we know that this really, really helps. 100%. What kind of what kind of things do you think Riot should be implementing into that drop system? What would you like to see? Um, I mean, it's not like you're, it's not like you're creating a wheel here. <laughs> there's, a, there's, you know, you can take the best of a lot of these other events and, and bring it into league. And I think it's going to do, it's going to result in, in, in good changes in, in the viewership and the excitement around the league. There's also been other stuff that Riot has been uh, doing in, in order to kind of increase monetization of esports. Like they've started to put uh, billboards is the wrong term, but like sponsors right. inside of the game itself. Right. Um, this is something that I mean is obviously fantastic from a from a, a team owner or, or a riot perspective when it comes to featuring sponsors because we can't you know unlike many other sports we can't have commercial breaks like in the middle of the game so it allows us right. to get those sponsors inside the gameplay and even if you look at uh, sports like like soccer that don't have these commercial breaks they at least have all of the boards along the sides of the arena to provide these sponsors but that's that's been a real serious like problem for esports monetization i would say it absolutely is because um when you have uh, inventory i guess you could say like the, the the science and the kmr inventory um when you have that inventory to sell uh, as a sales guy and just kind of speaking from personal experience like you need those type of things to to, to get sponsors excited and especially when it's inventory that the that the advertiser is used to buying so someone who sponsors like a you know, a soccer team, football team, um, and they buy those those billboards like in this in, in the stadiums. When you offer a similar item that's you know in these games, they're gonna go, oh yeah, I understand the value of that. I've been buying it for years. Cool, I could definitely set aside budget for that. And so I think those are really useful to get guys like over the fence to actually try esports that may not necessarily try it otherwise. Great. Well. Enough about the monetization. We're going to take a little break, and when we come back, we're going to continue this conversation, and then uh, we'll take some questions from Twitch chat. So if you guys do have questions for Jack about Cloud9, this is a great time to ask them, and we will take a look at them and get back to you shortly. Howdy there, buckaroos and buckarets. Welcome to another edition of the Cloud9 Roundup here on the Cloud9 Twitch and YouTube channels. Now, we may not be on Summon and Inside anymore, but we're still here on the Nines. So you can look forward to your favorite Cloud9 news every week. Starting with us today will be Connecting with Cloud9, presented by AT&T. Well, if you were looking forward to talking with those Cloud9 League of Legends players, that has been postponed to June 18th at 6.45 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. So come back then if you were looking forward to that kind of content. Now, you don't have to wait for content, though. Here on the League of Legends channel, yours truly did an interview with Reaper. You can check that out now on the Cloud9 YouTube channel. Finally, congratulations to our AD carry player, Sven. He hit number one and number three there on the League of Legends North American ladder. Who's number two, you might ask? Well, that's his lane partner, Vulcan. Those are some grindy players there in the bot lane. We might not have checked in with those World of Warcraft players in quite some time, but they've been doing good over on that WoW Arena circuit. 
lost to the Golden Guardians World of Warcraft team in the winner's final, but they took down Space Station Gaming twice, and then Golden Guardians, they swept them in the grand finals of the AWC NA Cup 3, and they will be your champions. On the Counter-Strike Global Offensive side, C9 did fall to Triumph Gaming and Evil Geniuses, but they took a win over 100 Thieves. This allowed them to get into those blast playoffs, but they lost 1-2 to the Brazilians in MIBR. Better luck next time, CSGO. You might have heard of this new little game on the esports scene called Valorant by a tiny little company called Riot. Well, Cloud9's already been looking ahead to the future of that esports scene and moved Tens, formerly that CSGO player, over to the Valorant roster. Now, ESPN YouTube will have an interview with Tens as part of their 12-hour launch special, so you can head over there to hear some words from Cloud9's first Valorant player. Also, if you want to see some gameplay, Tens did compete with some of his friends in the Twitch Rivals Valorant Tournament for North America. Now, they had a mighty hard group and they didn't make it out, but perhaps they'll be doing a little bit better in the future. Also, if you want some laughs, the social media manager for Cloud9, Portillo, well, he also competed in that tournament, so go ahead and meme him on Twitter for not getting out of groups. Over in Cloud9 PUBG Mobile, happy birthday to Beowulf. May you slay many more Grendels. Also, they finished in day one of the PUBG Mobile League Spring Split in 14th place and 17th place in day two. Finally, if you guys are still looking for some merch, it is Pride Month and Cloud9, well, they've been making some Pride merch to sell to you. But all the profits from that merchandise, well, it's going to be donated straight to underrepresented LGBTQIA plus organizations. So it's a good time to spend some money, get some nice Pride merch, and know that those dollars are going to some good nonprofits. Thank you very much for coming by this week for the Cloud9 Roundup. Now, back to that interview with Jack. All right, we're back with the Nines, with Jack Etienne, owner of Cloud9. And now we're going to talk about scrims and give you some gameplay-related stuff because we went down the business rabbit hole and I was probably the only one interested in that. So <laughs> let's talk about what goes on in your scrims right now. So you've been scrimming for what? A couple weeks? Looks like a couple weeks. Yeah. yeah the, the, this maybe is our little... third our third week of scrims right now. Yeah. So a couple weeks of scrims coming back into things. Your players took a nice long break. I interviewed all of your players uh, last week, talking to them about what they had been doing in their break. So you guys can look forward to that on some of the content coming up soon on the Cloud9 YouTube channel. But let's talk about performance because everybody's wondering right. Who's going to be good besides Cloud9 coming into the start of the summer split? So what have your, been your observations so far on the teams? Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Like the start of the start of a new season, um, but generally for every team that I've ever been with, after they win a world championship, they just kind of fall apart. And so I still, no matter how much I've seen the players be super dedicated, I still kind of had those, you know, jitters like approaching the scrims um and all the players like a lot of the other teams actually started a week or two before us so we expected to come in and just get smashed we're like okay we'll just you know we're gonna be learning the meta it's gonna be hard guys don't get disappointed if we get you know we get beat down and we immediately come and just start just destroying everybody teams that have been playing for weeks we're like wait they still suck um <laughs> but um the, which is great, but the thing is, is uh, what we have seen as the weeks have gone on is that the, some of the teams are getting better. And, uh, you know, FlyQuest is like one of the teams that we're going to be playing in first game. We play them Friday, which is crazy. Yep. We we actually, we you know, we did have some scrims very early on in our, in our, in our um, uh, first scrims, and, you know, they're still really good. And I hear around the league, they're still really good. So I think FlyQuest is going to still be really good. But what was really interesting to me is to see the improvements out of like Team Liquid. You know, they changed coaches, they brought, you know, tacticals out now full time. And like, you can just tell that team is re-energized. And I think that's really good. That's I, I want to have strong opponents. Cloud9 um, will be a stronger team going into Worlds if we have teams that are really pushing us. Um, and, you know, Team Liquid is they're 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 putting up a good fight i think they're going to be a great team they're not going to be a ninth place team anymore i think they're like uh, just by looking at 
like uh, our scrim so far. I think they're going to, if they continue like the, their trajectory, they're going to end up being a top three team this split and they'll probably be going to worlds i think along with uh cloud nine and FlyQuest. like uh, you know things change though you know it's it's <laughs> it's a, it, these are scrims so we'll see how they convert but i think they're going to be a really good team and a lot of team liquid fans are going to be really happy and like i'm not a team liquid fan i think everybody knows that. i wouldn't say this <laughs> i wouldn't say this unless i actually said you know, they're actually doing better and, uh, uh, but a better team good job Steve um there on the other side of the coin I see like you know there are some teams that are, are that seem just completely lost uh so like if I was to if I was to look at like kind of like uh to say the top five teams right now you know obviously there's, there's cloud nine mm-hmm. uh but there's gonna be FlyQuest right there there's gonna be TL right there um this is where it's gonna start getting surprising I, you know maybe it's not I think 100 Thieves is gonna be a good team I think CLG of all things, the 10th place team is going to be really good. So we're going to see the ninth and the 10th place teams, in my opinion, be the top five teams. That's a, now, that would be a pretty crazy result. That'd be, a, I mean, yeah. not really for team liquid because obviously like, you know, part of the reason they were in ninth place was they didn't have Broxa and the general lack of motivation that, I mean, I, I think it's understandable because even if, even if you are, you know, a, a professional player, it can still be hard to find motivation in a scenario where you're like, well, shit, we don't have our starting jungler. He's trapped in visa hell. And it, it, it can be hard to kind of like power through that uh, that difficulty. And then when you get him there, maybe, you know, they have the issues with double lift where he wasn't motivated. So he was going on the bench. And now that tacticals in there, probably very hungry to be there. Now that Brox is there full time, it seems like, you know, with the raw skill on this roster, it would be hard to imagine them in ninth place again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we might as well like venture down onto the the bottom five, the teams that are garbage, the teams like, what the hell are they doing? <laughs> you just want to uh, shit talk TSM. I, I, well, I mean, I like to shit talk everybody, uh, but yeah, I'm equal opportunity. Nice save. Like, nice shit save. Anyway, continue. Uh, um, but you know, I think you know, GGS, Immortals, TSM, they they're they're lost. They're struggling, and they're gonna need to they're gonna need to um, show a vast improvement over what we're seeing um, for them to be competitive. This this split, I know that like. Um, uh, they really want to be better, but like that doesn't actually buy you shit. Like if, unless you're actually, you know, you're putting you're putting in the work and you're and getting some results there. And I don't think I don't see those teams you know, getting better. Um, and so like you know, I think like on the bottom five, they're they're you know they're all vying for tenth place. They're not good. And so those guys need to 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 clean it up if they're going to want to be serious uh, for summer. It's going to be interesting this this summer playoffs because the top eight teams actually go to playoffs, eight out of ten. So for me, like there should be some sort of special award if you're ninth or tenth, like because that's <laughs> well, it used to be relegation. That that was your yeah, that mean, was your reward. <laughs> bring, it, bring it back, <laughs> bring it back, get them out of here. Because like seriously, like um, uh, they they need to they they need to to push harder like every owner that's in this league is you know putting um a ton of money into doing this and a ton of effort like they need to see better results uh, or the people are going to lose jobs and so uh, i want to see our region do better and and so i hope to see these guys pick it up and, and contest for for you know, top five spots uh if you if you do go to worlds which seems probably pretty likely which teams uh, there's a question in chat from Ragdoll Physics 28. Which teams would you want Cloud9 to play against? Like, which teams would you be the most excited to compete against at a world championship? Obviously, like G2 is a, uh, it would be super fun because of the history there between, between just G2 and Cloud9 and specifically between uh, Zven and that team. Um, a lot of re- mutual respect, and I think it'd be really fun games if we played against each other. Um, I would love to play the LPL teams um, because they're looking like incredible and and i want to be able to prove that cloud nine should be um among those guys is considered the best in the world so um uh it's really the lpl teams in g2 that's what i want to play fair enough uh we're going to go into some other twitch chat questions right now guys but we are going to do a puma gift card giveaway as well as a thank you for watching the show so if you use hashtag nice. puma in chat and you're in north america and you're over 18 you must be over 18 and in North America and typing hashtag Puma, then we will uh, we'll pick a random winner for the end of the show. So to continue on with questions, Naja fan asks that Riot opened up in houses for players to stream, but they never actually do it. 
And there was some movement in terms of setting up more in-houses between spring and summer, I know. Uh, what do you do you think there are value to these in-houses? Um, I, I think they can be. I think that we need some more tools to make it easier and then we need some self-policing from the from the players to make sure that everyone's like coming ready to play um the, some of the complaints i've heard is that the players are like playing out of role and so that's not going to be a good thing the, the game the whole game quality is going to be bad um and uh we need to to see that probably go away and i think the general seriousness of the players that are participating needs to be leveled up i like that like in uh you know with fpl like uh, the, pol the players self-police the quality of those games and I, I i would like to see more tools like that rolling out to to help make these uh in-houses like more common because uh definitely solo queue is definitely like it's one of those things that's a sore spot for the guys um and uh uh any tools that we could actually make these in-houses happen easier and, and increase the quality would definitely be beneficial i mean uh it, it seems like at least if if you go to worlds your plan would be to go to your facility because cloud nine we talked about this in the re interview i did with reaper it still maintains a very nice facility in korea and that at least will provide you a better solo queue experience and ability to scrub against the teams, right? Is that still the plan? Our, our nicest setup is in Korea, and it's really been a shame <laughs> that we we haven't been able to use it all year long. Um, generally, what we would be doing at this point, like this point in time, is we would be doing our our preseason in Korea. We'd mm -hmm. be flying back the week before LCS starts. So, uh, because everything that's going on with COVID, that's that's not happening right now, and I, I really look forward to having that back as an asset. Uh, uh, it's I, weird to me that you're the only team that has this. You know, we do things a little bit differently than than the other teams, <laughs> and um, you know, I, I, you know, everyone goes their own way. Um, but I, I really want to like I when I make decisions, I really want to make things. Yeah, you know, I want to make decisions that really help our players and our staff um, uh, in our day to day um, improvement. And uh, for us, it's been incredibly valuable to have a Korean facility. I think that we're actually going to be expanding it because we have uh, a Korean Rainbow Six team. Our entire Overwatch staff is out there. And right now, like, uh, you know, actually we, we dodged a problem because if the whole COVID thing wasn't going on, our LCS team and our Academy team would be going out to Korea and, oh, hey, there's these Overwatch dudes. What are these Rainbow Six dudes here doing here? We actually have a spacious issue. Um, so now this, we have an, uh, and basically a little bit of extra time now uh, between now and when COVID ends, we're probably going to look to expand or uh, into bigger facilities so we can house all the teams. What's crazy about that to me, especially um, when it comes to Korea, is that it doesn't actually cost you very much money. And it sounds right. weird when I say that, but the, the way for those of you who don't know, and that's probably most of you because this is very weird on a global level, uh, how Korean real estate works is that you put down a large lump sum as sort of a deposit and then you don't pay rent but your landlord will like invest that money and use the interest sort of to to make money if that makes yeah. sense so when you have a korean you know yes it takes a, a very large sum of money but you're not actually losing that money or spending it and you get it back whenever you you stop using that facility right so yeah it, it's complicated because like there's exchange rate issues sure and, uh and you're essentially looking to do uh you'll be paying about you know, you're, you're giving a large lump sum, like 80% of the actual property value. So it's huge, like yes. millions of dollars. So yes. for us to get this facility, we spent millions of dollars to yes. get to, to get these, these facilities. And at the end of the lease, we get everything back. But, um, you know, there has been some loss just like in the exchange rate. Um, sure. But but it doesn't really matter because I'm not trying to bring that money back to. No, no. no but my, my point is, is like even as a, it, with a well capitalized organization, like many of the teams you know, have this money, but you're, you're not actually spending it if that makes no. sense. Right. So Absolutely. yeah, there, there is a, there's a, there's a loss of opportunity to use that money, but in terms of getting that money back, like it just sort of sits there. So yeah. it, it is, it is a very economical way to build a facility in Korea is what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm sure people are probably thinking like, you know, what's to stop the owner from just taking that money and spending it. There's a lot of, there's a lot of protections in place to, to, to ensure you from that happening. Um, but uh, yeah, it's interesting because every off season I get several teams going, "Hey, we've heard about your facility. We know the players love it. Can we send our guys there?" And then um, actually, if we had the room, I would definitely actually house them. But that we, we're we're basically at max capacity all the time. 
So True Northpaw asks, what makes you different or what skills you bring as a CEO uh, that you think differentiates you from other team owners? Uh, three years ago, I would have said I'm an adult. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'd the thing still is, say that, frankly. <laughs> But the, th the thing is, is like um, the if I look around at my peers, at the other owners, like these guys are um, really you know, well established, very smart people. Eighty percent of them are traditional sports team owners, uh, and I think the difference is, is like for Cloud Nine, our core business and everything we do is around esports and our teams performing well and a lot of the other teams most of the other teams it's like a side business it's an exploration it's like diversifying their portfolio because their primary business is like running a basketball team owning like you know venues all around the world um making plot like basically making tools like you know blitz to to help making the, websites the, yeah yeah making websites <laughs> like every other team in the lcs is that you know running an lcs team is not the primary job um they're a subsidiary of some bigger company except for cloud nine we this is all we do we're here to to basically succeed on the backs of our esports program and nothing else and if we aren't good at this esports part of the business we're in trouble um and they all, all like really it's it's if you look even at the lec there's a some of the same issues and the only other team that's really like cloud nine is g2 funny enough they're also super dominant so i think like that's what's different is that at cloud nine and at g2 you have owners that like you know that all we think about is making our esports business profitable and successful we're not we're not dependent on you know uh we're, we're not you know basically uh just a, a bring along um you know we're not just like you know, the esports version of their, their basketball team it's just different yeah fair enough uh, yes, Waystation has, a, I think, a very good question, which is, can you give us more information about how using data analytics and Microsoft to help the LOL team? And this is, I don't know how much you're willing to say, but it is like super cool. And I think it hasn't been talked about a whole lot. But Cloud9 actually, for those of you who don't know, does actually employ an entire data science team, which, as far as I know, is unique in the space. Yeah, I don't think there's anybody that has a data science team like we do, um, and and the support of a major company like Microsoft to to basically empower them to be better. And those guys, um, you know, are looking to automate like the some of the simple tasks that we had to do, so we don't actually have to do them. As far as like tracking silly queue of, of our players, tracking silly queue of our of our um, our enemies or so competitors, not only here in, in our region but globally so like they're tracking literally thousands of accounts for us to, to try to understand like how these guys are better or worse um tracking in-game stuff like you know or tracking jungle pathing and provide information to us not just like for next week but like right after a game is played like you give us a sheet of information on on what just happened and how and just be aware of these patterns um and it, it goes in a lot deeper than that not all i don't really want to reveal like the secret sauce of it but like right. we we um we're constantly pushing, like asking our coaches and asking the players, what bit of information will make your life like easier? What will what will save you time um, on uh, and, and make you a better uh, player or a better coach? And uh, it's a every week we're meeting up, talking about like, hey, what? Here's the solutions we came up on last week's problems. What can we solve this week? And as part of that partnership as well, one thing that we're going to start integrating into the nines. So in the future, um, I'll probably be doing one on ones. I will be doing one on ones with League of Legends players. And one thing that Microsoft has built out in conjunction with Cloud9's data science team is a really cool new stats engine and stats dashboard that you will see on the show. So there's they're also doing stuff for us to present to you um, and give you guys some more data and analysis that way. So we'll be talking probably through that with one of the Cloud9 players next week. So you can look forward to seeing that. It is really cool. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing what these guys could do. And, and, and historically, we're like, hey, we'd love this tool. And like, you know, we would be we kind of sold like an idea of something that they could do. And we'd never see anything from it. But like Haley and Danny and our, and our data studio and science team, they literally like in a couple hours after making their request, were like, I think it could look like this. And then a couple of days after that, I was like, here's the prototype. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> oh, my God. That's yeah, actually it's very impressive. Thing. Yeah. The other thing that the data science team was very useful as well is when we were designing the Flashpoint format and trying to figure out 
play what how many playoff points we should assign based on the format and uh dr ken who has a phd in in what data analysis basically yes. was working with me and we spent hours poring over you know all the different scenarios that we could have uh dreamt of so that we were making sure we were kind of minimizing tie break scenarios and so it's been very useful let's just put it that yeah. way very very useful um let's uh, let's talk a little bit about player development because I'm kind of going to roll a bunch of people's questions into one here. Um, so some people have been asking, like, is Cloud9 going to uh, do something like 100 Thieves Next and they're kind of like high school initiatives. Um, but Cloud9 also, when we talk about players, Cloud9 has been hands down the most successful team in terms of developing native NA talent. You proved that a couple years ago when you took a bunch of rookies and ran them into the semifinals of the world championship, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it has been a continuous theme. Now we see Blabber going from a new player to MVP. So what is Cloud9 doing? How First off, how do you scout that talent? And second off, what are you going to do in the future in order to continue to unearth new talent in North America? Um, yeah, it's, it's one thing to actually spot the talent and it's another thing to actually develop it so like like you know uh, i think like a spotting actually isn't too difficult because you can kind of look at trends and so like you and you can talk around to the players like who's actually shaking things up and so like you that you've never seen before and you can start like getting a feeling like hey, these guys are up and coming but once you actually get those guys signed what you do with them is is like the it's the difference maker right you, you need to have good coaching good management um, a good team environment for them to learn in. and with cloud nine we've always very really had our, our academy me and our LCS team very integrated. They play in the same building. They eat their meals together. They work out together. And they, there's that there's a lot of you know, discussion about the game that's going on in all these different activities. And I think that really helps these new and up and coming players like feel like, hey, they're a part of Cloud Nine, and they actually have a real path to to become like a pro. And they also see that like given the they will have the opportunities if they prove themselves on the academy team to actually be on the LCS because we've done it several times before. Um, so I think that's like like on, on the academy level, that's how we how we focus on it. And as far as like the you know really early development stuff, we just launched our training grounds uh, and we're targeting kids who are as young as 13. Um, you can put in your application now. Um, it's and it's really going to be about like you know developing um, proper mindset and making sure you have better communication with uh, you know when you're talking to your to your uh, to your teammates as well as accepting and understanding criticism better. Um, just basically some of the basics of like you know what does it take to be a cloud nine player are some of these things that we're doing with our LCS team and our academy team, how can they apply to these young players' lives? Because like to be a Cloud9 player, you know, the first thing that you do every single day is go to sleep. If you don't have enough sleep, you're not going to be able to do anything. So are you going to a bed, at, you know, nine or, you know, at the minimum eight, but nine plus hours before you need to actually wake up? That's the first thing you got to do every day. Get your sleep. Get up and we go work out. Like before every single scrim day, we work out. We have a personal trainer that comes out with us, a strength trainer, and he works out with the guys for an hour. Um, and the players like doing that? Hell no. <laughs> they don't like it. They bitch about it the whole time. But guess what? When they're bitching about it together, they're building teamwork. <laughs> That's true. It's great. <laughs> it's actually great. And they'll bitch the entire time. That's right. Way they're, they're suffering unites them. Yeah, they're, well, why do why do I got to do this? Why do I, you know, I'm so tired. And when I go to my scrims, like I'm now exhausted. I'm like, guess what? When you're in a best of five, you're going to be exhausted, and you're going to have an advantage over all those guys you're playing against because you know how to play when you're tired. And like, like in these things, like we can teach these developing players. Like you got to have proper sleep. You got to have proper exercise. You need to eat well. We, you know, like we, you know, players will come to me and like, I've never eaten breakfast. I don't eat lunch. I eat one meal a day. It's like, oh, well, guess what? You can't join this team unless you're going to eat with us. Why? Because like you can't get through a best of five if you ate one strawberry. I literally have had this conversation with people. <laughs> and um, I love how know, dumb pro gamers are. It's amazing. And, and, and they, they get to game three and a best of five if they if they ate a strawberry. And they're like, I have no energy. I don't know why. I'm like, I, I, I weird. I, you ate nothing. You got no sleep. You know, you haven't been working out. You're tired. Game five. Of course you are. And your opponents are going to crush you because you opened up this weakness so i think we can teach these kids in these training grounds 
you know, nutrition, working out, sleep, good, you know, how to be a good teammate, how to give like feedback, how to receive feedback. This is stuff, all the stuff that, that's a requirement to be a cloud nine player. And I think there's a lot of parents out there that they hear these things are like, I want my kid to do that too. And now, <laughs> and so um, yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty excited about, about that program. Yeah, I mean, uh, some might say that if they hadn't learned these lessons already, that it was a certain degree of failure of parenting that has already occurred. I'm just gonna, you know, don't, don't say anything. Just gonna put that out there. Yeah. <laughs> being, being a parent myself, though, I know, like you have. I mean, I read books, lots of books. I watched lots of shows. I, I and I had a whole lot of information that was absolutely useless once you actually have that kid, because your kid's gonna do what your kid's gonna do. And so, if you can have a way to connect with that child and something they actually care about and then that person or that you know that they actually really like adore is telling this is what you need to do to actually be a pro <laughs> it actually is a lot more meaningful and you'll see much better results out of it fair enough um versus this is mom or dad saying you gotta do this you know <laughs> Sure. It also does mean different things when it doesn't come from the parent, right? It comes from somebody else who's paying them a lot of money. Uh, it, it, I mean, I've, yeah, I'm not going to go into that stuff, but it's, <laughs> it's painful. Like when I like, you know, say something, the kid is like, yeah, whatever, dad. And then the exact same thing will come from like, you know, a teacher and the, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> Why? <laughs> that's just, that's just how the world works. Um, yeah. I am so not cool to my kid. It's unfortunate. <laughs> uh, here's a good question from uh, T. Pecking. Um, talking about the Uzi retirement because of the health issues. Um, now, there are a lot of pro gamers that have had gaming related injuries or, or health issues. What is Cloud9 doing in order to prevent that from occurring to C9 players? I mean, obviously the working I, I out think, helps, right? Yeah, no, it's actually huge. Um, um, I've had a number of players that when they joined my team, they had wrist issues and when they left, they had gone away. And that the reason I had gone away is by proper exercise, proper sleep, proper nutrition. Um, we have a, you know, we have a, we have a physical therapist on staff that basically assesses the players as they come in, find out what's causing them pain, and spends a lot of time trying to to work and solve those issues. And I haven't had an issue yet with a player that we actually haven't been able to mitigate or or or. or remove that pain from them should they go through the exercises and stretching that they need to um so um you know, it's heartbreaking to hear what's going on with uzi because like you know he's an incredible player and it, you know he's put everything into into the game to get him to where he did and and to be robbed of his opportunity to compete because of pain that absolutely sucks i don't know the details obviously on it but i do hope that maybe with this rest that he can you know he can heal up and come back Let's talk about Valorant for a little bit. So first off, let's discuss, I, I know we're going to go a little bit over, so I don't want to take all your time, but many people have been asking about uh, the Valorant roster, which has not yeah. been announced yet outside of tens. Tens has been, tens has been discussed. Yeah. Um, let's get your initial take on Valorant as a team owner. What are your thoughts on the game and where do you hope the esports scene with Valorant goes? Um, I, I have, you know, I've got, a, I've got a lot of hope for the future of Valorant. I, I thought like the Twitch Rivals uh, event was was really fun to watch. I think this, you know, the the, um, the experience as a viewer, I think is really good. And uh, I'm really taking a slow approach, I guess, to, to making my team because it really is really early, like for that game. And so I, I don't think we're going to see like the level of competitive events that we see at other games. Um, for probably a year or two. Yep. Um, so I want to make sure that I build the team right. I'm not going to just, you know, um, uh, over invest on players who've been playing the game or he haven't even played the game, which is happening in a lot of places um, just because of their experience in other games. Because the thing is I've seen, I've been through this before, you know, when the guys I first hired for my Overwatch team were super good they smashed for the first like several months and then the team like completely fell apart before to be fair before. you did win a, a championship we did it's awesome <laughs> it's great and so so i guess i guess what it is it's like setting expectations and understanding how it's going to relate once the game is completely up and running so any team that you invest a ton of money into now regardless of the success that you're having in the first year probably need to have that drastic changes like within a year or two and that's just the way it works with new i games. agree and um, uh, I saw it with, you know, here, Heroes of the Storm. The first two years we won BlizzCon, you know, and then two years later, all of a sudden, like Korea caught up and was just dominant. Um, and, and Overwatch League 
kind of similar actually. Um, and I think, you know, we're going to see uh, two years from now, like a very small percentage of the players that are joining teams now will probably still be playing at the pro level. And so um, with that in mind, I'm, I'm trying to, to just take a, a more conservative approach to, to getting into the, into the game. What do you think about some of the kind of Cloud9 CSGO alumni like Skadoodle and Hiko heading over to T1 and 100 Thieves? Uh, there's just so many of these kind of uh, top tier players that are no longer active in Counter-Strike trying to make it again in, in Valorant. Um, I think it's exciting. I think I love seeing Skadoodle play again on a professional team. The guy's amazing. Brax has been like, you know, the greatest story that never never was, which really sucks. Uh, and what happened that with him at Counter Strike? I think that, that the penalties are too yeah. harsh on him. I mean, everybody and, thinks that's ridiculous, but <laughs> yeah. And so I love that he has a place to shine now, and he can compete at the top at the top end. And I wish him the best, and I, I hope they're just super dominant. Uh, but that said, like I think like two years from now, most of that team will be gone. Um, and uh, and it's not like a knock on any of those guys. I think they're fantastic, but I just it's just the patterns I've seen. Do you have a timeline for announcing the Valorant roster? No, that's and that's the thing. It's like I've I've told my management like because they feel the pressure of actually making an announcement. Like why why do we actually need to to do anything at this point? Like there's no event, there's no pending required like true roster lock. So just take your time. Um, make sure that our players are having fun. They're getting stronger, getting better. Make sure they they fit into fit into the culture that we've we've developed through through our lcs team and so um i i don't feel any pressure to actually announce what do you hope the valorant scene becomes because you have extensive experience in the csgo valve open circuit as well as the advantages and disadvantages of being a franchise team under riot for league of legends if you could pick how valorant gets run as an esport what would you pick Hmm. That is a tough question because there are there are parts of each like sure yeah uh, there are parts of each game that I really like um, and there are parts I don't like um, I I love like um, how much Riot supports their esports program and I like I love that they're you know that my expectation is to have like, a full role full rollout in Asia so that you know China really gets to participate because I think it's super important for our sponsors and for viewership um, and um, so. What I'd like to see is like I'd like to see Riot put just as much effort into the esport of Valorant as they have with Riot maybe, or with League of Legends. Um, but I'd like to see some of the format stuff that we see from Dota 2, like with the majors and then the TI mm -hmm. and the the massive in-game uh, uh, triggers for for fans to get behind the event. I would love them to take that best stuff that you see out of Dota 2 and the and the, and the way that the like the, the actual tournaments are operated. Um, pull that stuff out but put riots like you know consistent support behind it and i think that'd be pretty special and then the actual spectator experience of counter-strike like it is still the best esports to be a fan of and to watch like there's nothing like it and take as much as you can from from what they do in counter-strikes events and and, and bring it into uh, valorant and i think it's going to be an incredible future for it but again and you're really excited about uh, them using Flashpoint because you partially own it to operate tournaments, aren't you? Absolutely. <laughs> I think we're going to have the... We're, 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 no, we're, like, seriously, though, we're going to have the best event um, uh, in, in the Lawrence scene. And I, I, and I can't wait to actually show what you guys are working on. <laughs> but I yeah, mean, the, the, I think uh, we're going to have a very fun, um, unique broadcast with flashpoint and it's gonna be i'm super excited to see it roll out me too hopefully um but yeah all right uh, i will let you get back to the scrims uh, i know you guys are gonna have some of those in just a little bit so thank they you they just finished their workout so it's a perfect time to perfect. show up like, excellent, oh i am so time. sorry oh. i missed the workout because just so you know I, I actually work out with the guys every single morning um there's something real special when you're a 47 year old man and you can like outrun or outlift a kid who's 20 i, I don't know why like old guys like to do that but it makes me feel good <laughs> <laughs> you're falling right into it <laughs> um let's so just so you guys know the nines is going to be changing a little bit to feature uh Cloud9 players. Next week, we're going to be talking to League of, Legend, uh, League of Legends player. And what we're going to do is we're going to take their first week of games, and I'm going to do a really 
deep dive into uh, how they were playing things out, what their thought process was, taking a look at some stats courtesy of the new Microsoft dashboard. So expect like an hour long conversation that's really going to go very, very deep into uh, players decisions and, and how the games went. So it should be exciting if you guys are into deep analysis. As for Summoning Insight, it's back on the Insight on Esports channel. This is part of a larger initiative of which Cloud9 is a part um, of developing a, a content platform. We can't make announcements about that right now, but I it is going to be very cool, guys. So just it's we're trying to move a lot of long form content onto that channel so that it's a, a more focused experience for you. And we've got uh, the feature on the, of the cloud nine organization, the cloud nine players here on the nine. So it's part of a broader strategy. Just so you guys are aware. Um, and I'm sure you're excited about that too, Jack. Very excited. And one, <laughs> one quick note, remember we start on Friday. This, this is the first yes. time ever we played on Friday night. Yes. So we're playing, FlyQuest on Friday night. It's going to be super exciting. They're a great team. And we play 100 Thieves on Sunday. So we actually uh, will be scrimming on Saturday. So unusual. But it'll be interesting. <laughs> and it'll be fun. Um, and but these are two great teams. So I'm, I'm super excited to see the analysis that you're going to, analysis you're going to do out of it. Um, and you guys don't want to miss it. Yep. So uh, be sure to tune in. We will be doing this every Tuesday. So watch the Cloud9 Twitter. Um, it'll be up on the Cloud9 YouTube as well. Uh, so be sure to keep up with the nines. Uh, next week will be League of Legends. We'll be doing a bunch of shows with League of Legends, uh, LCS and Academy players. And then we'll also be doing some Counter-Strike content and, and other as uh, other players from other games as well on this channel. And we'll try and get Jack on here more to give you guys more updates. So we'll still be here 10 a.m. Pacific Tuesdays. Uh, so be sure to come back. Uh, the other content will be on the Insight on Esports uh, Twitch channel if you uh, would like to look at that as well. So thank you very much for joining me, Jack. And uh, we'll see we'll see you guys again next week for a chat with an LCS player. Thanks for having me. Man. See you.